Um, even though um, Ashutosh Bhattacharya uh, is the one scholar who is actually one of the first scholars to work on Purulia Chok. Uh, he did, in fact, uh, spend a lot of time and effort uh, thinking about the etymology of the word Chau. C H H A U is the way he uh, wrote it down in his texts and uh, took it back to references to Chauni, to kind of military encampments and tried to draw a link between a particular context uh, where the dance may be performed as well as the form of dance. So this idea of a martial dance is something uh, that he sort of, uh, I think was one of the early ones to throw this idea in. Okay. Now there aren't that many scholars after him who worked on any one of the Chao uh, dances in the way that the world uh, refers to this dance form. Most of the practitioners in all three, three areas call it Chho, including Purulia. The three areas are Mayurbhanj, Serakella, Purulia, all of these were kingdoms uh, that had a very strong Adivasi base, mm -hmm. where the kings themselves or the chiefs till very recently would have been Adivasis, uh, who then over a very long period of time and through an interface with Hinduism, mm -hmm. uh, would have also taken on features of Sanskritization as Srinivas might have put it, or maybe even Rajputization. Mm -hmm. So they were clearly as, as Shurajit Sinha. Uh, the anthropologist who worked a lot, especially in Purulia. So he didn't work on the Cho dance itself, he's worked on other forms. Now, what is interesting over there really is that um, you can see that there is something in common that uh, the dance forms of these three regions have. Uh, though there are stylistically also very many interesting differences. One is that there are certain uh, particular kinds of dance gates and postures which is called the chalk. Uh, I am not a dancer myself, but I've read everything that has been written on the Cho dance and you can see that there is some particular uh, kind of grammar that they all have in common. Though the way that this grammar is then manifested and rendered in these forms is very, very different. Now the Mayurbhanj is the only one of the three Cho dance forms that does not use a mask. Now the other two, Serai Kella and uh, Purulia, Purulia is now in West Bengal and Serai Kella is in Jharkhand, uh, Mayubhanj is in Urissa, has have had very different trajectories in uh, post-independence India. So you can see over time uh, that the patrons of the dance also had a very big influence in the way that this dance developed. So in the Serai Kella form, you will find that the kings also uh, took on abstract themes. So they, they have dance compositions which are based on actually mental states like solitude or sometimes some part of nature. Uh, there's a, there could be a, a very self-conscious sort of orientation to kind of uh, the aesthetics that we associate with the ancient dramatists like Kalidas and so on. Uh, because also I have a feeling uh, this was because the patrons also were quite learned uh, in, in, in some of these kinds of textual traditions and in some of these aesthetics. Um, it is also one of the more lyrical forms of the Cho, I feel, mm -hmm. Serai Kella, which uses the kind of disjointedness that comes with this play on the body when the facial expression is fixed. Now, Purulia Cho, in a sense, took a somewhat different route. Um, I was fortunate enough actually to do my field work and uh, since I did anthropological field work, I actually lived in this village uh, which had a very important guru for the Cho dance, Gomhi Singh Mura. Uh, that was his home village for more than a year, so a year and a half. And So I got to know that team very well and I'm not a dancer but I was able to watch some of the best dancing uh, in that whole Purulia region. Uh, Bagmundi, which is uh, the particular Thana in which Jodha Falls mm -hmm. um, is also famous uh, for actually uh, being culturally very rich. So it, it has its own variants of the Cho dance and also of the particular kinds of musical uh, forms, uh, the songs that are an important part of the Cho dance, that the Cho Nache um, So and they've been a uh, several, not just Gombhi Singh, but other very, very significant dancers, even before Gombhi Singh Mura. 
um, this would just be a little prior to independence. Okay. Huh? Uh, people like Madhu Bhatt, who was not an Adivasi, uh, Gobhi Singh Mura is a Bhumij, and uh, while this dance really comes to full fruition in the way that we know it today, under the patronage of Bhumij kings, amongst these, uh, the kings of Bagmundi were very significant, but the patronage doesn't go back very far. So I have a feeling again this dance form sort of crystallizes fairly recently. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I probably, I, I, I don't know, 160 years, maybe even less. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult. So, and I'm going by oral history here, which I was fortunate enough to be able to get anecdotal evidence from uh, other people who were living in this village. Uh, so they take the route back to sort of uh, three kings before um, the present one. Now, of course, the direct line has, has, has become extinct. There was a cousin who had taken over. He was a Congress MLA at the point, say about 35 years ago, in the 80s when I was doing my field work in Purulia. Uh, I think actually there was an ossuary. The bones would come to Chorda of the Bhagmundi kings, the village where I did my field work, which was also the only village where masks were made for the Purulia Cho. The mask makers also had migration histories, of which was the kings who would actually ask them to come, uh, given them land in this village to settle, precisely to make masks for the Chodas, as well as murtis uh, for pujas like the Bhadu Puja uh, and other so you can see that there is all, there was also a living memories of kings taken on uh, customs which they may not have had originally. Uh, uh, customs from sort of dominant uh, castes around um, in the rest of Bengal and Purulia, kind of Hinduization going on if you like mm -hmm. that word, I don't know. Um, but also then that the, that the dance was taken, taking on a kind of crystallization. So uh, dances, uh, themes were now being composed around stories uh, from the Purans, from the Ramayana especially um, and so on, uh, where these masks also were definitely then divided into types. Uh, you could see then uh, quote if the different steps were being codified, different charles and halves, so you have a poshu chal for the animal gait for the different kinds of animal figures that are part of this composition. Uh, you have the, the godly gates uh, that I've written about as well as the more human gates for Rishis, Munis, uh, you know, Adivasis. After all, Shiv also appears as an Adivasi in some of the stories in the sacred texts like where Arjun is being tested. Mm -hmm. And now these then also plug in interestingly and take on a very contemporary feel when you think about the politics around Chota Nagpur mm -hmm. and the coming into the state of Jharkhand and so on of which Purulia now is a border region. But after all, they, they are culturally contiguous. So again and again, these are being sort of re-embedded locally in terms of current political and cultural interests. So in that way, the Cho, I would say, are very living forms. So where many of the other dance forms and these areas really were very rich in the forms of music and dance that they had. But unfortunately, over the years, there are very few left. But Cho is one of the ones that has managed to retain its living quality and its vibrancy and I think precisely because and maybe because of the kind of patronage they got from the kings in the pre-independence period uh, from the local kings over here that they were able to absorb these different kinds of influences and come up as a kind of very rich composite whole, right? So you've had different kinds of strands uh, from, the ki from the kind of interface that these regions developed with uh, everything that came from the outside. Huh? Influences of sacred texts, uh, other kinds of aesthetics influences because some of these musical forms actually take the form of rags. Uh, they're definitely self-consciously playing with different rasses. So you could see that there is an aesthetics uh, which would also link it up with other kinds of dramatic forms in other parts of India. Now, how much of this was self-conscious or did it come along uh, with the kinds of appreciations and the particular dance forms uh, that the patrons as well as the dancers worked with uh, is difficult to say. I would say that it must have happened through a very long process of osmosis. But one thing I should say 
that uh, I think it's very important to look at the aesthetics of these forms. So rather than just think about these as tribal dance forms, and I know Ashutosh Bhattacharchi has had a very uh, large role to play in trying to exoticize them. Mm -hmm. Mass dance, you know, definitely the other, non-Hindu, uh, with a veneer of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Little difficult to say that about Serai Kella, but these were also kings that went through a long process of Rajputization as did other kings in this region. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting region because it's so hybrid. Mm -hmm. But I would say it's important to remember that the kings were highly cultivated, the people are still highly cultivated. So if you go to these places, even now you will say just the kind of knowledge that the local people have about their own cultural forms is phenomenal and it is not superficial. And no amount of television and film watching or the you know, uh, intervention of other media seems to have affected it. There will be changes that adapt to these other forms, but somewhere along the line, people are pretty much self-conscious about the structural compositions, the grammar of these forms. And it doesn't seem to me that these are dying out. So I think some of it is because also the patrons were, I think, highly cultivated people. So you could see at one time, uh, these were very, very poor because I have actually gone back to look at whatever is left of their palaces, etc. There wasn't a huge gulf. These were not rich Zamidaris. These were very poor and in fact, uh, you know, as much prey to things like tuberculosis and leprosy and things, not leprosy but definitely tuberculosis, which is pretty much endemic here as it is in many other parts of India. Uh, and they died out because of poverty amongst other things. But you could see that the kind of cultural sophistication that is still there must have come because of the very highly developed sense of aesthetics that they had, which is why these forms took the particular kind of coloration that they had and continue to be very vibrant now because otherwise I think they would have died out. Once this community participation had died out, they would have died out. So that's a little bit of the history. So I think some of the history can be recovered. I mean, it has been also done for the Serai Kerala Cho because I think the Rajas were also able to write in Bangla so they've, and, and, and in Uriya and uh, other languages uh, so that they actually have written up uh, things mm -hmm. and there has been research. Uh, but unfortunately, Purulia Cho has come up with a lot of, I would say, unfounded myths which tend to exoticize these as Adivasi and tribal. Now, interestingly, what has happened as a result is that this very idea of what it means to be an Adivasi, to be a peasant, has been inflected in the dance as well. So the dance is responding to these modern myths, generated, I have to say, first by folklorists like Ashutosh Bhattacharji, and then later on by journalists, uh, by other scholars, they tend to be a bit unthinking in the way that they use words like Adivasi. What would it mean in a place like Chota Nagpur, mm -hmm. which has seen such a very porous connection, so many different Adivasi groups with such different histories. The Santhas self-consciously close themselves off from other mainstream Hindu movements, caste movements, cultural movements, etc. The Bhumij did not. They in fact adopted Kshatriya models. So I have this sort of thesis in, in my, my argument in, in my book called Writing Identities, which also deals with the Cho dance in that book, and I can give you the reference mm -hmm. later on, uh, is to actually say is that they were very open to the outside, but I think allowed it then also uh, to mold whatever was available in the building up of a court culture. So if you see in all these three regions, unfortunately in Mayurbhanj, as uh, the Mayur Bhancho is travelling to other parts of India, taking on a great amount of classicization, I would say, when I see it being performed in Delhi on the, you know, on, through the Krishna Leela or through the Ram Leela that is performed uh, every year. And so many steps from the Mayur Bhancho that I can see. As it is becoming more and more refined, you will see it is being danced less and less in Mayur Bhanj itself. And this I have heard from scholars of Odisha, who have worked in Odisha. I myself have never seen Mayur Bhanj in Odisha. I mean, I'm, not that I visited Odisha that much, but I haven't. Serai Kaila, you still see Serai Kaila artists coming regularly all over. You do see Mayur Bhanj artists, but you can see something is happening. It doesn't have the same vibrancy anymore. 
and I have a feeling it's because it's become detached. I don't want to romanticize roots, but it's this way of living in corporate incorporation of novelty of outside influences that has made the Cho dance what it is today. Given its vibrancy, as it has also changed, we may not find all these changes aesthetically appealing to us, but I still feel that there will be enough great choreographers, great dancers who will be able to do something creative with them. Um, and so maybe I should now move to some of those issues right now. Mm -hmm. So some sense of the history, I would say we really need to go back uh, to where these, um, the more innovative things in these three different dance forms developed. I know for Purulia, Bhagundi was very important. Now this is obviously in contrast to the levels of poverty that exist today and probably existed even then because this was a tiny little Samidari. But its cultural import was I think far in excess of its material base. Huh? So it was an interesting inversion where these kings in fact um, used to invite great singers and great dancers from all over the Purulia region. So they are really quite famous. There were three kings in the pre-independence era who were important for the Cho dance, right? Now, in the first case, it was just beginning, but the two great patrons were Hridayanath Modern Mohan, Shingdeo. Uh, now, both of these, I, I still have people who were old men at the time when I was doing field work. Now, I don't know what old means because none of them had birth dates. So, there's no documentary evidence. They looked old, but I don't believe they could have been more than in their early 70s because the mortality rate was still fairly low. This is a very poor area, uh, you, you know, subject to endemic drought, right? So you had to be pretty exceptionally healthy to have lived to your 70s. So you could see that it was very much in historic memory that not only were the kings becoming Kshatriyafai, the Bhumij kings, but equally the Cho dance was taking on a form by which these kings then, they were as part of this claim to being Kshatriya, not only did they invite a family of Brahmins which could sort of give them that Kshatriya status, but they also then tried to create a court culture. Now interestingly, the kinds of forms that they patronized were things from this region. They patronized certain forms of music, they patronized certain forms of dance. Cho dance was one of these, the Nachni was the other. Mm -hmm. Now you can see that there is a court culture in which the way these dance take shape made sense. They were often associated with certain ritual occasions, a particular, you know, the, the, the time when the agricultural season starts, the locale, the first dance would have still been held in an important Shiv temple or some other temple. Then of course it could move to other places. But then the ritual sphere and the courtly sphere are often inextricably connected. After all, uh, the king would have also received his Abhishek in that famous temple, okay. uh, which is still a very important local pilgrimage site in okay. Bhagmundi, right? Where as part of homage, as, as part of the ritual oblation, uh, all dancers from the region come and perform at least one item, one pala over there, Lohoria, okay. uh, Shiv uh, Mundi etc etc. I'm sure similar things must have happened in Serakella. In fact there are books on it which tell you some temple uh, where the king was also the patron and so on. So I feel why it's important to look at these because they also tell us something about the aesthetics of the dance. What is dance over there? The second point now if to come to the kind of popularity that these dance forms have achieved in post-independence India, I think it's largely also because the discourse uh, that tends to see Adi, Adivasi culture as an exotic other to the Indian mainstream, whatever you want to call it. Now, what has happened interestingly, uh, that this exoticization has been taken up as a theme by many of these dance forms themselves, where not only do you have interesting compositions around the theme of what it means to be an Adivasi, but equally then other kind of popular dramatic elements and I know in the last um, 15 years I think, maybe even 20 because uh, I did my field work in uh, 80 to 85 was when I was in very close contact with this part of Purulia, Bhagmundi and it was self-consciously chosen because it was such a rich culture in the area. The village where I did my field work was the only village where the masks were made. And it had three very famous dancers, two of which actually, one was a Mahato, one Pumich, and one actually was a Bhat, 
Brahman who were the sort of helpers of the Brahmins who came to legitimize the king. So one came from a group that were also mask makers. Mm -hmm. These are Bengal, they call Bengali Jap, Bangali Jap, Bengali caste. Okay. The others are uh, groups. See now the word Jap doesn't distinguish between tribe and caste. That's the word you use for a, a group, a community, okay. however you want to call it. Uh, the other two are from Jats uh, that preceded the Bengalis and I have their migration histories over here. Well, Lal Mahato, very famous also as a composer of the Chumur song mm -hmm. as well as Gombi Singh Mura uh, Bhumij who is the first and who would have been part of the same group to which the kings belong, Bhumij, uh, but also received the first Padma Shri for Puruliya mm -hmm. There is one other after him named Pal Mahato not from his village, but he also, Bombi Singh uh, Mura was his guru as well. <laughs> now what happens uh, post-independence is that Bombi Singh himself was fairly conservative. Now he always felt, he was unlettered himself, but he always felt that if the authentication of any of their dances uh, could not be found in the sacred text, he said Shastra, that if it's not in the Shastras, how do we know what Chal? what bhav, what move to give to these dances. So even when he composed and he was constantly being asked by you know government officials, well-meaning, folklorists again very well intentioned to say why don't you dance on themes that are more contemporary like Adivasi themes. So he said I could also make up themes like you know Santhals uh, with their agricultural activities, women singing, you know, compositions on Shidukam, the great uh, revolutionary leaders of the, you know, some of the tribal movements there, Bhisa Munda, etc. Though Bhisa Munda is not so important in Purulia, right? But Chidu Khan definitely, he would say, but look, where are these stories in the Shastras? How would I know how to depict them? Where would be the authentication? Now, this is very interesting for, for you know, for someone who is unlettered, who's never read any of these things himself, or who actually has no interactions with people who are learned in these Shastras. But I'll just give you this example. While I was doing field work, one day there was a huge discussion. I was also sitting in one of the murti maker shops where a lot of this gossip takes place and most of our field work is done through gossip anyway. You know that, right, as much as I do. About where this word Harijan comes from. No, the word Adivasi comes from. Adivasi, Adivasi. And of course, you know, I mean, so they consulted the Brahmin who, who is lettered and he knows enough Sanskrit said, look, this word was invented by Gandhiji, of course he meant Harijan. Uh, it, you won't find it being mentioned there. So then the whole activity was around, is this word a, a translation of something that we can find in the Shastras? Now, you couldn't get more structuralist than this, would you? You think these are recent inventions? So then they sort of deconstructed, what does Adivasi mean? First, inhabitant. Now, what would be the symbol that you would use to demarcate, identify mm -hmm. the first inhabitant? Okay. And then they came to the decision that it would have to be the stone. And the stone comes from the menhirs. Now, in Chorda, the stone menhirs, right, are not vertical, they're horizontal. The ossuary, so the stone actually may not be engraved, but the stones actually demarcate the place where uh, an important set of bones have been interred. Right? Mm -hmm. So people will be telling you that this is where Raja Ridwanath was interred, this is where Raja Madhav Mohan was interred. Then you ask what happens after that. After that they become Kshatriyas, they cremated. We don't get their bones anymore. Right? And that is, your bones go back to your ancestral village. So Gombi Singh Mura's bones would have gone back to where his ancestral village was. His father's village, this was his mother's village. His father died when he was very young. He was also a famous dancer, Jipa Singh Mura in the Bhagmundi court but never grew up in that court. Okay, so when, so then they decided that stones would be the symbol of the Adivasi. Now then they came back to going back to some of the Purans and there was one Puran only available in the village so they consulted that and you know the Purans always begin with stories about the way the world comes to be, the cosmos comes to be and the way the significant groups come to be that go up to make up the world as we know it and the cosmos as we know it including the world of the gods, right? So then they came to the story of Surabhi guy who's been sort of stolen by the Kshatriya king Jamadagni 
and of course she is asked to defend herself by her protector, her Rishi, right? And then of course she stamps her feet four times and these four different autochthonous warrior emerge. Now he says that look, all of us must have emerged from these. Mm -hmm. And he says there is reference to one caste group called Pasha. And he says, uh, one group was called this, one group, I've forgotten now. And one group was called Pasha. Now, Pasha means stone mm -hmm. in Sanskrit. So, obviously then, that must be where we emerge from. So, they composed, their origin of the Adivasi story really was a playing out of this myth. So, interestingly, even so, the word Adivasi then was translated into something mm -hmm. that could be then made meaningful within the universe of the Shastras mm -hmm. and then composed. Of course, there are other groups and interestingly in the last 15-20 years you find is that with the boom of uh, new media and especially with the CD, with the video revolution and now with the computer revolution, you find that this kind of um, cinematic technology is quite cheap. So you find people at fairly low cost can actually buy a video kind of uh, documentation material to make them very cheap video clips on um, you know music videos but equally dance videos on the Cho dance in Purunia mm -hmm. and you find this happening all over India but what you find that it has also led to very interesting changes in the dance form. Mm -hmm. I think already say about 20 years ago just before this video boomed mm -hmm. because now a lot of these uh, the Cho dance is available also through video clips. Huh? So it has allowed for a lot of new things to emerge in the dance form. Now I would say the form already allowed it, but already you had a kind of dramatization through voiceovers. See, it is a dance form, so there was no conversation. It wasn't dance drama. But in the last 20 years, and I think this is just before the video boom in Purulia, uh, the dance form took a significant change. Like I'm sure the mask made a huge change and made the Cho dance what it was, the introduction of these voiceover speech. Mm. Uh, so the mask remains, that's become the kind of marker of the Cho. Uh, mm. It has to be masked, whatever, the you know, you might introduce lots of different steps, musical forms, etc. But the mask doesn't go. You've introduced whole genres of new kinds of masks to refer to human beings. Okay. And I could tell you a bit about that as well. But in the dance form, by introducing speech, even the, if the actors aren't speaking, remember, uh, the lips are closed. You have mm -hmm. little holes for the eyes, little mm -hmm. nostrils to breathe in, but you can't be heard much. Mm -hmm. And their bodily gestures are very much those that don't, that require the face to be still. Mm -hmm. Only one expression. So everything is done through the body. I'm sure the Greek actors with their masks also, mm -hmm. the acting styles would have been very different. So what it has enabled is a lot more social themes, dowry, not just you know important Adivasi historical themes, mm -hmm. but other themes as well. Uh, the last one I saw, and this was on video, was on Pulan Devi, interestingly, where a lot of the Draupadi type motifs are coming mm -hmm. in. Okay. You know, um, not through the main story, but through motives like the Vastraharan, the shaming of, and the and the woman becoming goddess through her shaming through her disrobing, mm -hmm. where she reveals herself. Now that itself is a very structural motive that you that you see associated with goddess stories all over South India for sure. Because mm -hmm. Hilary Baitel and Shurman have worked on them so we know. But maybe in other parts of India as well. So interestingly again, even when you have a secular story, uh, it gets transformed into something else. Now why should the Pulan Devi story be so important? Now interestingly, and you can see there's such that there's something about oral memory that keeps things going where something written may just sort of fade. Because I remember when I was doing field work and this would have been in what? In 82. The village, I mean one morning, everyone the night before had gone over and they travelled quite far away. This was somewhere sort of close to Giridi, which takes about, you know, quite a few hours to go from Choridan transport by no means was efficient then. So they all sat on tractors and things like that and when then there are very few tractors available. The plots are too small uh, to actually avail, uh, allow them to use mechanization much and they are poor. But they hired buses, tractors and so on and pushed off to see this Jatra on Kulan Devi. And this was from some troop in Calcutta and there was a huge buzz 
everyone was very excited about how this woman becomes a decoit and it was very much the Draupadi myth being transformed. Now interestingly, for I hadn't seen the Jatra myself. I had gone home and gone to sleep. Didn't even know many of them were going. But I could see so many of the echoes of what I'd heard people telling me about that Jatra so many years before that in this particular video of the Phulan Devi story in the Chho dance. So again now of course there's the Shidhu Kanu story, there's even stories on the Kargil war. Mm -hmm. But again, interestingly, whatever stories are picked up, they will be transformed in terms of the dominant mythic stories, I think, uh, that were already available to the Chho dance before that. So I would say while there's been a lot of change, the change has also gone about by introducing formal elements into the dance. So I know now when they dance particular stories around Durga, especially elements of the Nachni Nach are formalized in it, which wouldn't have happened earlier. Though already you could see a kind of certain roles. You introduce sort of a, a non-storyable theme through the through the na, through the de, and the word used for these dancers were dancer, dancer. Mm -hmm. Right? Nachuar is what a, a Cho dancer is called, mm -hmm. Nachuar. Uh, these are these people who do these kind of, you know, Jatra type of dances, Bollywoodization, mm -hmm. you know, hip swinging, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those kinds of twirling of the hands, which is not part of the Cho at okay. all. Okay. It doesn't have elaborate mudras, but this kind of say, maybe from the, um, in Bengal it would be, I think it comes to the Jatra through this Khamta Nach, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of bai, what you call Baiji Naches, maybe a kind of influence from the Kathak, type of notches entering. Now those people are called densars. Now there was a densar part of our troop didn't live in the village. I asked all men, but I think they they may be transsexuals, okay. what we would call transsexuals now. Interestingly how they become incorporated into the dance form. Now a densar comes from the word dancer. Now increasingly that particular form which was just put in there for light relief, right? So these would be the people doing the aarti around Ganesh. The first episode always has something around, you know, a some dance by a Ganesh taking on, uh, a dancer taking on Ganesh's form to dance only because that's the Vandana, the salutation to the deity and Ganesh is the god of beginnings. So all the dances, um, any dance will begin with the Ganesh Vandana, mm -hmm. right? Especially, always Ganesh, none of the other deities. So they will be doing the aarti around Ganesh or you might introduce a fourth scene where they'll be doing this or they'll become gopis in a Krishna Leela scene or something. Now that is acquired and I asked one of the the, den, the only densar I ever met that you know where did you learn, who was your guru? So he said I am self-taught and he told me that look I have watched films so I really trained myself. And of course the others used to laugh at him a bit and mm -hmm. I'm sure you know it's because he was different but already you could see there was a place for something else entering mm -hmm. which then other things have entered through the voiceover, greater jatra like elements but interestingly also there's this other feminine dance form called the Nachni mm -hmm. right which is supposed to be a dance based on the Ras Leela mm -hmm. very much like Kathak is but comes maybe from the courtesan culture of Bengal as well, um, you know, which entered the theatrical space of 19th century Calcutta, Jatra and so on. It's now found a place even in godly themes like some of Durga's steps, mm -hmm. especially when she's dancing themes from the Devi Mahatmya, like um, when she comes in um, that particular episode when she's defeating the two uh, Rakshases not Mah Mahishasurvat, the one before that, um, what were they called? Suddenly I'm forgetting the names, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But where actually uh, they, she comes as a seductress. Mm -hmm. They want to marry her. It's mm -hmm. a, I think a nephew and an uncle. And she takes, so the way that the seduction scene is played out mm -hmm. is through the introduction of the Nachni Nach. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how some of these mythic themes are getting greater and greater elaboration which earlier when the dance parlors were very short uh, mm -hmm. and therefore you know very rapid, very vibrant, very energetic um, and of course it's difficult to see those early ones one place where I got a clue of this not only from my own village 
uh, Chorida, but also when I watched that documentary by Ritvi Khato, which still had uh, dancers Lal Mahato and so on mentioned. Okay. So see, so you could see there's been a different uh, side change in values there. The Poshu Chal was very important. Many of the more martial forms like the Asur Chal, um, all the very martial godly Chals and so on. But equally now see some of these more. So good Durga isn't just stately when she's killing the Asur, mm -hmm. right? But she also takes on some of these seductive uh, elements. Ha, Shumbhani Shumbhava, mm -hmm. Shumbhani Sham, uh, two Asurs, whom she first comes in as a seductress and then of course takes on this very martial role and kills them. Now, the, I saw this episode in Purulia many years ago and then again in Delhi in the IGNCA when they had a Cho dance festival. Interestingly, so many steps from the Nachni dances that I've seen in Purulia again have now been incorporated. Right? Mm -hmm. Now to become part of the general code now of the Cho dance. So I can see its vibrancy also comes from the fact that it can take all these different influences. Like it can take so many musical incorporations. I remember already when I was there, Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram was a very important theme tune. Mm -hmm. Not sung but played by the instruments. So they introduced new instruments like the cornet. Mm -hmm. huh? Now they even have a keyboard and stuff which you didn't. Now, how does this all square with the dhamsha, the kettle drum, deep sound, mm -hmm. or with the dhol, with all of these things? Interestingly, uh, it's through the stories. So it's, I think the musical changes go with the introduction of some of these other aspects of the stories. So in some ways, I think there is a pretty much a very self-conscious knowledge about what can fit. So it's not just a random uh, introduction of novelty for novelty's sake. There is a sort of way in which the aesthetics also enable this incorporation at certain places. If you introduce the flute, and I'm not saying the flute isn't an instrument already available here, uh, it will be when you're doing things with the primordial hunter themes, including Krishna, could be an Adivasi hunter. Or when you introduce the horn, mm -hmm. it will be in certain themes. Now, when I ask, but look, okay, but this is clearly outside, where did it come from? No, no, we used to have the, it was called the Shinka, it was always there. Now, this was a horn clearly, you know, and I even know there was some French musician who had, uh, you know, who liked their dance form very much. When they went to Paris, they were gifted this. So, I, I jolly well know that it wasn't the Shinka, but, so you can see there's a way in which even newness can be incorporated into the grammar over here and stories may follow, right? Uh, so there's a way in which this continuity and change with such a cliched kind of, uh, you know, utterance, when you think about it, but if you think about what it could mean, there's a way in which you can give it a cho coloration, mm -hmm. but make it something new. So now with this, I think already there were this voiceover introduced only with certain kinds of stories. Shidhu Kano as well as the short social themes of dowry deaths and you know women's um, exploitation and stuff like that where the voiceover gets introduced. Now that has been given further elaboration when you now make the cho for the video, right? Okay. Where you can obviously because you can take it to other scenarios, you don't just need one ashok, one place, so you can show it against different backdrops. It has allowed some kind of change. Now, I don't think it's influenced the steps that much anymore, but it certainly brought in many more different kinds of musical backgrounds, I noticed. So, what I tried to do is, I got a whole collection of video clips on the dances that I had already seen. And these were pretty much traditional dances, as well as the new ones. In the new ones, you can see there's a further greater sub-specialization in the different kinds of acoustical effects. Like you'll have a special voiceover only about bringing in demonic laughter to show the Pakistani soldiers. They are after all the Asurs in that. So, you know, it allows a greater elaboration of music. Some of it seems to be more successfully adapted to the form. Others I feel will die out. They, they, they jarred a bit. But in other ways, you can see there's a greater elaboration of the masks. Already when I was doing field work and I can see that even more, um, you would show a certain, you know, there either the faces would be divided in three types. 
the asuras, the demonic masks, snarling faces, where you have the teeth being shown either as fangs, but as one solid white mask. Mm. The gods never have mouths open. They always smile, you know, like Ram. When mm. you, you remember the Ram, the Sagar okay. TV serial, enigmatic smile. Because remember, Ram is also a deity. Shouldn't mm. be showing too many human emotions. Okay. So all the gods mm. had this sort of semi-divine kind of smile. And you had human figures. Now, not too many, but Rishis, Munis, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Shiv coming down as this Adivasi hunter to test Arjun, those kinds of stories, right? Where you show not just frowns and wrinkles on the forehead, but also little vertical black marks to show that these are human teeth, okay. right? So you can already see that at the level of the masks, some notion of realism was creeping in. Mm -hmm. huh? to show certain features. Now clearly that has been extended a bit, not just now with masks, I, there's not that much change happening to the mask level, but bringing in uh, you know more kind of realistic elements, again realism after all has to fit into the code of a performance. So here I would say uh, the kind of realism comes from the Jatra mm -hmm. code rather than from film, not Bollywood I would say. Or, or maybe if it comes from uh, maybe Tollywood, Bengali film, it will come via Jatra, which I still think had a very, very major role uh, in the way that it shaped the aesthetics of much of our films. If not, um, you know, it would be Jatra and Bengal, it would be some kind of, again, popular dramatic mode. Because remember, all these tend to sort of, you know, mediate that gulf between folk and popular. Uh, so they urban, popular, they can be mediated by all these electronic media, mm -hmm. but equally then they impinge on the folk. So I would say it's through things like Jatra, mm -hmm. you know, the same melodramatic gestures, modes of speaking, etc. The last thing that, and maybe I'll end here, mm -hmm. um, see, is that there was interesting innovations in, in the mask now, but in a way that is detached from the dance and the story, because now masks have become curios. So you can all already make tiny masks and already when I was uh, in, in the early 80s, some people were making small uh, masks of santhas, shantal shantali, a male and a female to be sold as okay. objects and they were very cheap. Now what was interesting already is those tiny masks were providing a new aesthetics to create the Adivasi dance mask okay. huh? for the character of Shiv who comes disguised, remember as Kirat the hunter mm -hmm. in the Mahabharata mm -hmm. to test Arjun before Arjun is given those uh, <clears throat> that gift of weapons mm -hmm. uh, by his father Indra uh, to fight the war, the great Kurukshetra mm -hmm. war. Now this is a very popular episode which was actually composed, this pala was composed by Gobhi Singh's troop in Chorta itself, it was very popular. Now over time you found that this small Santhal curio mask was expanded to become the Adivasi mask with these teeth, mm -hmm. human teeth. So it's interesting how, you know, from the curios, something went from being a dance mask to becoming a curio, mm -hmm. which folklorists have lambasted as being, you know, the worst kind of tourist culture, which is, you know, leading to the destruction of folk culture everywhere. Um, without refining too much of a point in it, I would say that cultures should be able to withstand it and incorporate it creatively as it happened here. Another interesting feature I found um, two, three years ago, I mean, there are so many craft melas now in Delhi, including ones at Siyad Park, Chitranjan Park, which the temples feel it is their duty to encourage the folk arts of Bengal. They are the new patrons now, the people, uh, because these are, after all, it's the local population and that have made these temples what they are now is that they invite mask makers from Purulia town. Now I met somebody whom I had I think seen being born, now a young man in his, well, in his early 30s I would say, and his son who'd come. They belong to the family of mask makers that I already were working with in Purulia. They are now composing masks. Dukhi mm -hmm. Chashi is one theme, looked a bit like a Navajo Indian, mm -hmm. right, which don't have stories as yet or you know, a mask based on a Kathikali mm -hmm. dancer's mm -hmm. face. So I asked, so he said, oh, this one is still waiting for a story to be composed on it. 
And he said, this of course would be part of the Krishna Leela because this is a Krishna mask. Okay. So see, so this idea that, you know, so this workshop culture, this culture of circulation now where folk artists from different parts of the country either come for workshops or they come to the Crafts Museum or Delhi Hunt. So there's a new kind of borrowing happening mm -hmm. uh, precisely because the state is now the patron, right? Mm -hmm. And the aesthetics uh, that the patron has sort of let loose has created these new kinds of opportunities which the people now I would say are responding to in extremely interesting kinds of ways. So I would say, I mean I'm really waiting to see what happens next with the Cho dance. It is by no means being destroyed, not in Purulia, definitely not. I mean, and its latest avatar is, is, is are these in the form of these video clips, which are really, really popular. Uh, not just in Purulia itself, but I would say uh, even in neighboring districts. My first encounter with such CDs was in Medhnipur, which is where I'm still I'm doing field work right now. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they are very famous for their um, scroll paintings, but very few people, you know, outside the cosmopolitan cities like Delhi and so on have even seen one of those scores. Certainly not people in many people. But people are watching these video clips on dances all the time. Mm -hmm. And my taxi driver told me this when he heard I had worked in Purulia. I said, have you seen? So I went and bought some and then of course I went back to Purulia. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed uh, some of the studios, the, the makers of these video clips and it was very interesting. Because often these are little jhoki jhopris, shacks where they've been made. I also interviewed the first person to actually produce one of these. And interestingly enough, he turned out to be the younger brother of uh, the person who was my sort of local guardian. She was a geography teacher in the local women's college there. And I used to stay in her house whenever I came to Purulia town on my way back to Calcutta and then on to Delhi. So I used to come by bus from my village, stay the night in her house. And she was the, my first contact in Purulia. Uh, she in fact had taken me to Chorda. Uh, she was a geographer, so she was in charge of their national service scheme program of reforestation, okay. forested area. So she took me and I, you know, that's how I got my first contact. Now her younger brother had, I don't think had studied much after school. Uh, so she set him up. You know, he used to live with her. And so she set him up with equipment, uh, sound equipment, mm -hmm. and then later on video equipment to make marriage videos. Mm -hmm. Now, he sort of evolved from making marriage videos, he saw the potential uh, to actually make videos on things like the dance forms there. Mm -hmm. And then he realized that this was really important because people loved it. So he is not making this anymore. He in fact invested in very expensive equipment and recently he's even been editing feature films in Bengali. Okay. Because it's cheaper, uh, labor charges and everything is cheaper in Purulia, you find that uh, people from Tollywood, mm -hmm. uh, that is the Tolly Gunge uh, kind of film studios in Kolkata are even coming down to edit films there, even shoot because Purulia is a favorite place for shooting films. Initially by Bengali filmmakers, uh, Shotujit Rai, Riti Khotok, they've all shot there, but now even international filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So see, so he's still making video films and I met one or two others who are on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. So it's as if I can see something involving over the last 30-40 years, from the time in my 20s when I was a researcher to now. Mm -hmm. huh? and, and forms that are really moving in very, very vibrant ways while others are dying out. And we have this story of loss. But in other cases, we have this story of, I would say, you know, vibrancy, creativity, change. Some of which may look ugly to us, uh, but actually, I don't know, not if you know the dance well enough.